Hello and welcome to another episode of Health and Wellness Save a Life. I'm Gargi Rawat. Cardiovascular disease affects the heart and blood vessels in spite of advancement in cardiovascular healthcare. Cardiovascular disease is still the leading cause of death for both men and women. An important contributor to this burden is sudden cardiac death which refers to a sudden lack of heart activity. Even young adults are suffering from sudden cardiac death due to sedentary and stressful lifestyles. Now it has been proven that bystander CPR improves the rate of survival by almost 50%. It is even more important if you have a loved one who has a history of cardiac disease as research reports that the majority of cardiac arrests occur at home. Save a Life is an initiative through which people will be made aware of the early signs and symptoms of cardiac arrest so that patients can get to the hospital in time and also be trained on CPR if the need arises. We have with us eminent cardiologists to help us understand this very important issue. We're joined by Dr. Ashok B. Malpani, Senior Interventional Cardiologist, BM Birla Heart Research Center, Kolkata. Dr. Rahul Shetty, a consultant cardiologist, Dr. Rahul's Heart Care and Speciality Clinic, Bengaluru. And Dr. Saket Goyal, Chief Interventional Cardiologist, Kota Heart Institute, Kota. Thank you so much, doctors, for joining us on the program and taking time out uh, to talk about this very important issue. Dr. Malpani, first to you, what is coron coronary artery disease? Can uh, this disease lead to sudden cardiac arrest? Yes. Yeah. As you say, heart is the most dynamic organ of the body and most efficient. It beats 60 to 80 uh, times per minute and pumps 4 to 5 liters of blood every minute. And through this blood, it supplies uh, uh, oxygen, nutrients and glucose to the whole body and also to the heart muscles itself. And these, the blood vessels which supply the, these nutrients to the heart muscles they are known as coronary artery disease. When this fat-rich uh, uh, material starts accumulating inside the blood vessels, this condition is known as coronary artery disease or atherosclerotic heart disease. And initially, these are very small streaks. It gradually increases in volume. When it becomes more than 60%, then it causes significant obstruction to the blood flow to the heart. And when it becomes more like 90% or heart, 100%, then this condition is known as acute coronary syndrome or acute myocardial infarction or in layman's term, it is known as heart attack. Heart attack is the most common cause of sudden cardiac death. And by causing heart attack and malignant ventricular arrhythmia, this coronary artery disease causes sudden cardiac death. All right, Dr. Shetty, how long does it take for a cor coronary artery disease to develop and what are the causes of the disease? Yeah, uh, just looking at the, the traditional uh, the risk and the day, the, the way it progresses. So usually the coronary artery disease takes years to decade to develop. But with the recent changing time, lifestyle, and uh, you know other associated newer risk factors. So now we uh, hear more and more terms like accelerated atherosclerotic heart diseases, premature cardiac diseases. So these are all taking the you know the front seat off late. And uh, to be uh, precise on this now, the, with the changing you know paradigm of uh, coronary artery disease, so the disease progresses in a very accelerated format. So sometime even within months to year, a somebody who never had any symptoms of coronary artery disease can end up in a frank heart attack. So uh, the looking at the aspects of you know the disease pathology, the pathology starts very early in the teens. So somebody who is 15, 16 years can also start developing, you know, building plaques inside the coronary arteries. And for symptoms to develop, so one has to have a significant obstruction to the flow of blood inside the coronary artery so that takes few months to few years in the worst case scenario we don't have a really you know uh, a live estimation of somebody's you know plaque yeah we do have uh, some tests like you know octs and pulpograms so you can do that but it's not very practical test where we can apply to the society yes all right, uh, Dr. Goel, what is the link between cholesterol and heart disease? And if the body makes its own cholesterol, why does the diet matter? 
Yeah, thank you, Gargi. That's a very relevant question, and we get it asked uh, all day. So, uh, most trials, even involving millions of patients worldwide, have shown that cholesterol levels are directly related to the incidence of heart disease, and and in different populations, the cholesterol levels may be different. Like in Indians, we have heart disease at a much lower cholesterol level. In diabetics, we have heart disease at a much lower cholesterol level. But in Western countries, the cholesterol levels may be a bit high. As we have greater evidence, we have uh, lower guidelines for cholesterol. Like few years back, they used to say that the cholesterol level of around 130 to 100 may be okay. But now, for all diabetics, and especially for Indians, it is now advisable that the LDL cholesterol level should be brought down to less than 70 to give us the advantage of not getting atherosclerosis. In cardiac patients now, the trend is that the, we try to bring down the LDL to even 50. The second part of your question, Gargi, that uh, when body synthesizes cholesterol, why does it matter what to take? So, I always give the patients the example of a horse, like, a horse eats only grass and the body synthesizes whatever it needs from that grass only. So whatever fat we have in diet is not required by our natural feeding habits. Like we are all ancestors coming from animals. So animals don't take any amount of fat. Even most animals don't even take milk in their adult life. So whatever fat we are taking that is extraneous, that is not required. The whatever amount of cholesterol is required for our body functions can be synthesized by the liver mm -hmm. from the pure vegetables or pure whatever vegetarian or non-veg diet that you take. Yeah. All right, Dr. Malpani on this issue of uh, cholesterol, as we discussed, high blood cholesterol is an important risk factor for heart disease. If a person's cholesterol is less than 200 uh, mg per DL, should that person worry about heart disease? Yeah, as Dr. Rakesh Saket has also said, cholesterol has got an important correlation with the heart disease. There are numerous, numerous studies which have proved that if the cholesterol increases, our the incidence of heart disease increases and vice versa, if it decreases, the incidence also decreases. But cholesterol has got two parts. One is HDL cholesterol and one is LDL cholesterol. It is the LDL cholesterol which is a bad cholesterol and which should be targeted, not the total cholesterol. As he has already said, for a normal person, LDL cholesterol should be less than 70, uh, less than 100. But for people who are either diabetic or have suffered from a heart disease in the past, their level should be uh, around less than 70 or may, maybe up to 30 to 50 also in very severe cases. But it is not the only cholesterol which is the culprit for the heart disease. There are so many other risk factors as well, like diabetes, high blood pressure, smoking, genetic tendency, sedentary lifestyle, central obesity. So we have to take care of all these risk factors, including the LDL cholesterol, to feel safe that, yes, we are in a safe zone. Right. Uh, Dr. Shetty, now let's talk more about heart failure. And does heart failure mean immediate death? Uh, can heart failure occur without knowing it? Well, Gargi, heart failure is generally, you know, classified as an acute uh, congestive cardiac failure. And also it's called chronic heart failure. So generally the chronic heart failure is a prolonged, long drawn uh, battle. So where the patient lives for a couple of years from the diagnosis of heart failure in acute setup usually this happens post uh, massive cardiac uh, heart attacks mi the myocardial infarction where there will be an acute loss of uh, uh, the heart muscle where the heart is unable to cope up with the 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 pumping of blood to the other organ that that's where uh, it carries a very high mortality if it is left unattended uh, uh, the other factors are, there are other conditions other than the heart attacks like the inflammation of the heart muscles, what we call myocarditis. So even the acute uh, fulminant process, so heart can suddenly give up, uh, leading on to an, you know, sudden flooding of the lungs with the fluid, what we call, you know, pulmonary edema. So there again, it carries a very high mortality. In general, when uh, somebody survives in heart attack, the what you develop an aftermath of an uh, myocardial infarction. So generally people live for a couple of years. Uh, so 50% survival for five years is, I mean, it is well documented. And with the innovation of newer modalities of 
uh, medicines and other devices, the the outcome of heart failure has really, really improved over time. All right, uh, Dr. Goel, can uh, heart failure occur in young people? What are the pre-existing conditions that increase the risk of heart failure? Yes, so we as Indians have a lower age for heart attacks and as with medical advancement, with technical advancement, the survival from heart attacks has increased. The total socioeconomic burden of heart failure is definitely very high, especially in young people in India. So most young people who now survive heart attacks because of maybe timely medical therapy or timely angioplasties, they end up having some kind of dysfunction of the heart, their pumping of the heart is decreased. And that may lead to after once your, you know, there's term known as EF. So when the e, once the EF ejection fraction comes less than 30%, then these patients are prone to have recurrent arrhythmias or recurrent admissions, hospital admissions for treatment of heart failure. In terms of uh, what exactly predisposes to heart failure, there are many conditions such as sedentary lifestyle, obesity, diabetes, blood pressure, in addition to patient's genetic history, which may predispose a given person to heart failure. But the plus point is that now there are very good medicines in hand. We have recently great advancements in terms of uh, new treatments that we have in medicines and also some therapies like uh, double chamber pacing and other therapies, which may help these patients to sustain a normal quality and normal quantity of life. All right, we'll sip into a short break now, but we have a lot more questions to ask our panel of doctors, so do stay with us. Welcome back. You're watching Health and Wellness and we're talking about heart health. Let's go across uh, to the doctors with our questions on this. And Dr. Malpani, how does heart failure cause sudden cardiac death and can we prevent it? Yeah. Uh, Gargi, before I answer your question, let me uh, first explain you. Because in, lang in layman's language, they call heart fail means a cardiac arrest. But in our language, heart failure is means the weak, because of the weak heart, it cannot pump the enough blood to the body, which it should be. And cardiac arrest means totally cardiac standstill. The heart failure occurs because of the weak heart muscles. And because it can't supply, there occurs electrical malfunction, which can give rise to vent ventricular arrhythmias and there can be cardiac arrest. And coronary artery disease is the most common cause of this malignant ventricular arrhythmia. And there are, uh, even if we uh, have this uh, heart failure or sudden uh, ventricular arrhythmia, there is nothing to get disheartened. Because nowadays we have got lot of medicines for the control of uh, heart failure like AC inhibitor, ARNI, beta blocker, MR antagonist and now uh, SGLT2 inhibitors also. So we have a lot of armamentatorium and there are various anti-arrhythmic drugs are also there which can control the uh, arrhythmias also in this group of patients. In spite of control of failure and uh, in spite of giving anti-arrhythmic drugs, if these patients still have arrhythmias, then in these patients, we can either implant a triple chamber pacemaker like CRTD or CRTP or plain intra, intra ICD means implantable cardiac defibrillator. This is a small machine which is implanted in the chest. It monitors the rhythm of the heart. And when the heart rhythm becomes irregular and very fast, like uh, with, and it detects the arrhythmia like VT and VF, and it gives shock automatically and restores the normal sinus rhythm and restores the circulation. All right, uh, Dr. Shetty, CPR can save a life is what we've been saying, you know, in these programs. But how would a layperson know if he or she is doing CPR with the right technique? What result from CPR uh, should one expect and in how much time? Uh, that's right, Gargi. We are running a uh, CPR with Save a Life campaign. So as in your opening statement, you rightly said when CPR is done in a proper way, so the survival can be enhanced to a greater extent. So as much as to 50% the immediate survival if it is delivered in a correct fashion. So it is, uh, it is now right of everyone to know, the, especially the lay rescuers, so how the CPR should be given. So they need to follow certain 
uh, protocol. So when they witness, you know, somebody's uh, somebody has just collapsed or just fell unresponsive. So all that you have to do is first take up your phone and dial 911 if possible and ask for some more help. So when such things are happening, so you have to prepare this person if he has, you know, fell in prone position or in sideways. So we have to put him on the back and his hands has to be by the side. And once that happens, so the person who is going to deliver the CPR has to sit by the side of the uh, subject uh, near the chest and he has to uh, you know recognize the central portion of the uh, chest just beneath the nipple so he has to place his hand the left hand if he's a left hand person so he has to put the right hand first on the top of that he has to put his you know uh, the heel of his uh, hand on the on the the right hand then he has to kneel down and and he has to deliver the compression exactly over his chest so uh, so when he delivers that the weight of the body should act as an fulcrum so it should not come from the elbow so elbow has to be kept locked so this is very important and the compression rate so when you when you start giving the cpr so you should deliver about two compressions per second in in one minute you should be able to deliver about 100 to 120 compression and once that happens the second aspect where everybody has to know when you compress you have to allow the chest to recoil so this is very important unless you don't allow the chest to recoil the the effectiveness of the CPR will come down because we are trying to create an artificial circulation between the breastbone and the backbone. We are trying to squeeze the heart. So when you squeeze the heart, naturally heart needs to relax before you give the, the, the second compression. And second one is uh, the depth, the, the, the force which we deliver the, the compression. So that should be at least two inches deep. So it should not be too much. It should not be too less because that's how we create an effective, uh, you know, create an artificial output till the help arises. So these two factors are very important. One is we have to maintain the rate. If you do it too slow, so it's become ineffective. If you do too fast, then the filling will not be there. So you have to manage uh, uh, in a way that, you know, it should be delivered about 100 to 120 uh, compression per minute. And coming to the, uh, the latest CPR protocol, you know, it used to be ABC, airway, breathing, and finally the last used to be the compression. Now that has been changed to CAB. Now we call it as a cap, means the compression is the center piece of uh, the CPR uh, process. So the, the giving and rescue breath is become optional because that's the one, especially in the post-COVID situation, you know, some of the lay rescuers may just, you know, um, hesitant to deliver a CPR because they have to give mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing. And it also obstructs the process of uh, cardiac massage. So the CPR, in CPR, uh, giving and in, in, in breath is a kind of an optional thing, especially so when we have to give this the rescuer, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the breaths, when you suspect, you know, the drug overdose or, you know, post drowning, uh, something like that, that where the, the breathing is also as essential as the compression. Otherwise, the primary focus should be on the cardiac massage itself once you secure the airway. The airway has to be secured by, you know, uh, just tilting the uh, neck and uh, and lifting the chin up so once you do that you can also look for any foreign materials or foreign bodies in the mouth if it is there the lay rescuer can clear that with his finger or index finger or something like that so uh, these are the primary things and when we are dealing with both you know a um, uh, kind of situation where you have more than one rescuer in that in that point you can deliver the breath so the breath to compression ratio is when you deliver uh, a, a 30 uh, compressions, so you can give two breaths. And for infants and small uh, children, so you can give about 15 compression for two breaths. All right. Uh, thank you so much, you know, for explaining that extensively. Now, 
speaking of CPR, Dr. Goyal, lack of CPR awareness is a big uh, challenge in India. Uh, tell our viewers why it is essential for people to learn CPR. Yeah, it's very essential and I would like to tell me about my practical experience. I have done almost 9 to 10 out of hospital CPRs in cricket ground on air airplane and all 9 of those patients could be shared out of hospital. There are so many countries like the Netherlands, they did a extensive uh, CPR social uh, project and they taught the CPR to schools, to volunteers and they could reduce their out of hospital mortality by almost 50% and almost 50% of patients who collapse on the road, in the offices, by the roadside, by any cause. It could be heart attack, it could be drowning, it could be compression, it could be some kind of choking. And 50% of these patients were able to reach the hospital. And of those 50%, 50 percent, 50 patients could be discharged to home. So that's a very big number, considering that thousands and thousands of patients collapse anywhere in the world from various causes. So many people collapse. So even if 25% of them can be saved, to discharge back to home. That is a very, very big amount of life saved. So there are two concepts of CPR. One when we train people, first is to remove the inhibition from the mind of the people that any damage can be done to the patient because that patient is already going. So whatever you do will create some kind of benefit to the patient. And second is, of course, to learn the exact technique, as Dr. Rahul said, that the depth of compression, the speed of compression, the recoil, everything is important. And for that, it is very important that you do not only learn the CPR in theory. You should actually train yourself in dummy. In my city, we have a CPR program by a, by a Trust Heartways, and we have done almost 60 workshops where we have taught around 5,000 people to do CPR on dummies. We have six dummies, and we go and do training sessions where people come and practice on those dummies, how exactly you have to press, what depth, what speed you have to take, and the, by the lights on the dummies, you can actually understand what kind of CPR should be done. And it is so uh, um, uh, wholesome when you learn that these techniques have been used by many people and we get newspaper reports that somebody who learned in those sessions have actually gone and saved a life in the next few days. So it is, you should learn the CPR, you should know the theory, then you try to attend a training session where you get a, get a hands-on training on dummy because practically you will never learn this on a living human being. So unless you have learned this CPR on a dummy, you can not perform it on some emergency because that inhibition in your mind, whether you are doing the correct procedure will always be there. So as and when you get a chance, learn first, repeat the training because you never know at what point of time you need to apply it in your family, in your friends, in the society. Always try to save a life. The very important point is that every one minute of delay in CPR will decrease the chance of survival of the patient by 10%. So whenever you have a chance to do CPR, start right. it early, do it fast. Yeah, thank you so much. Right, and Dr. Malpani, finally, how does an automatic external defibrillator uh, help a person who's in cardiac arrest? Yeah, see, when the cardiac arrest occurs, there is a cardiac standstill. There is no rhythm, no circulation. There is no supply of blood to the brain and other vital organs of the body. And the, you, you must be aware that this uh, brain ischemia starts within few seconds only and the uh, brain damage starts within few minutes, two to three minutes. So in this emergency situation, it is very important to st uh, restore the circulation by CPR. And as Rahul and uh, my other colleague has said, effective CPR is very important, means compressing at the rate of 100 120 and the depth should be three to at almost three to five centimeters and compressed between the sternum and the uh, the uh, and the uh, spine. This uh, external the effective CPR increases the chances of uh, defibrillator and the defibrillator increases the chances of survival. So these uh, C correct CPR and AED uh, they are complementary to each other. External automated external defibrillator is a machine which is there outside. You have to connect the two pads to the patient. One is on the and the anterior aspect, and the other one is on the lateral aspect. You have to charge, and then uh, you have to defibrillate. This machine automatically judges whether the rhythm the person is having, whether it is defibrillatable or not. If there is a ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, then this machine automatically senses this rhythm and gives a shock automatically and, uh, and uh, restores the normal sinus rhythm. And by restoring the normal sinus rhythm, there occurs uh, 
circulation, effective circulation and blood supply to the vital organs of the body. As your as your uh, initial comment also you said a correct CPR and an availability of a defibrillator can right. uh, improve the survival in this patient by 50 to 60 percent. All right. Well, thank you so much, doctors, for joining us on the program and sparing your time to raise awareness on this very important issue regarding heart health. Uh, with that, time for us to slip into a short break. Thanks all for watching.